السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Many of you are familiar with the story of Musa and Khidr in the Holy Quran. When you look at the story of Musa and Khidr, you find that this story is only referenced once in the Quran and it's mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf, the 18th chapter of the Quran. The Quran doesn't specify or mention when this incident took place in the life of Musa alayhi salam. However, some traditions that are cited by Allama al-Majlisi in Bihar al-Anwar, he mentions that this encounter took place after Musa alayhi salam had performed all of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. So this final story that I want to share with you is a story that most likely took place at the end of Musa's life. And there's a high possibility that this meeting between Musa and Khidr occurred during those 40 years when the Israelites were wandering through the wilderness. After they refused to enter the Holy Land, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially banished them and they were in exile, roaming through the desert. So it seems that this encounter most likely took place during a tea, the, the period where they were wandering aimlessly through the wilderness. Now, when you look at the, the narrations that speak about the background story, you know, what exactly, what actually led to this encounter between Musa and Khidr, the famous narration that you will find is that Musa alayhi salam was once speaking and he was delivering perhaps a sermon to Bani Israel. And as he was speaking, he thought to himself, he had a moment where he thought that there is no one who is more knowledgeable than I am. And based on this narration, Jibra'il alayhi salam, the angel Gabriel descends and basically alerts Musa that be careful, O Musa, don't think that you're the most knowledgeable of all people. There is a servant of God who has been endowed with knowledge that Allah has not given to you. And hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires Musa to meet this special servant. Now the problem with this report, and this report is found in some of our hadith sources. The problem with this narration is that on one level, of course, you have the problem of the chain of transmission. The senad is not something that is that we can say is, is reliable in terms of the, the narrators of this report. But aside from that, what is more problematic than the chain of transmission is the content of the narration itself. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Musa to be the one that he speaks to directly because he exhibited this quality of humility and humbleness. Musa alayhi salam was the most humble of people. And therefore, it is, it is highly unlikely that after all of his experiences with revelation and the tri trials and the tribulations, that at the end of Musa's life, towards the end of his life, he would fall into the sin of ujb, self-admiration, where he's boasting about how much knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him and how there's no one on the face of the earth who's more knowledgeable than him. Even an average mu'min does not think like that. So to attribute something like this to Musa is, is problematic. Now, what we have is a quotation for, for, from Musa where he says, is there anyone more knowledgeable than I am? Now, instead of considering this to be a declarative statement, what is more likely is that someone among the Israelites probably said that 
after listening to Musa and being in the presence of Musa for so many years, one of the Israelites probably commented that I do not believe that there is anyone on earth more knowledgeable than Musa alayhi salam. At that moment, Musa alayhi salam, of course, Musa is naturally going to feel concerned when people start lavishly praising him. Musa is very attuned to the condition of his heart. At that moment, Musa alayhi salam turns to Allah and he says, try, essentially trying to reaffirm his humility, he says, oh Allah, is there someone out there who has more knowledge, more knowledge than me? Is there anyone in the world who has more knowledge than me so perhaps I can meet them and benefit from them? So Musa alayhi salam takes this as an opportunity to reaffirm his humility by asking Allah to give him the opportunity to meet someone that he can learn from. And this is much more consistent with the Musa that we see in the Quran, the humble, the God-fearing Musa. The Musa who does not even think that he is superior to the most wicked people among the Israelites, who has this complete humility. So what seems to take place here is that, and look at, look at the humility of Musa. And this is a very beautiful aspect of the story of Musa, is that he rises up in spiritual rank. He goes from being a prophet of God to a messenger of God. Then he attains the rank of being Kalimullah. He becomes one of the prophets of Ulul Az. And then at the end of his life, he asks Allah to make him a student. And this is the epitome of humility. That Musa السلام, never gets to a point in his life where he feels that, okay, there's nothing left for me to learn. There's nothing that I can benefit. I, have, I am the source of knowledge and no one else has anything to offer me. So Musa السلام, he is instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Jibra'il to go on a long journey to meet this special servant of God. And this is where the story begins in Surah Al-Kahf, ayah number 60. So this is the background story. So now Musa alayhi salam, at the end of his life, now he is on a mission to go seek knowledge from someone else. All his life, he's been the teacher. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to seal the life of Musa with that badge of humility where my great prophet Musa, at the end of his life, he humbles himself and he acts as a student. Now, ayah number 60 from Surah Al-Kahf. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِفَتَاهِ And when Moses said to his youth or his servant. Now here, the question arises, who is this person who is accompanying Musa on this journey to go and meet Khil. There's a lot of discussion among the scholars regarding the identity of this Fata that is with Musa, that goes on this journey. Some have said that this is Yusha ibn Nun. This is Joshua, the son of Nun, who will later after the death of Musa, he will become the successor of Musa. And this is possible because either at this point in the story, Musa السلام, is preparing to leave behind this legacy of knowledge, this final piece of knowledge. He wants to learn it from Khil and then transmit it to Yusha ibn Nun, who will be his successor. That's one possible explanation. Some scholars have also asked, why wasn't Harun with Musa? Musa and Harun, they're partners. 
in their mission. Some have said that either Musa السلام, left Harun to look after the Israelites because ultimately there always needs to be a guide among the people. Or this is a point in the story where Harun has already passed away. And hence, Yusha ibn Nun is the only one who is left with Musa alayhi salam. وَإِذْقَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَى Now some have said, Fata means a very young man. And Yusha ibn Nun was presumably not very young. The successor of Musa was probably not a young man. So why would Musa refer to him as Fata? Now again, in the Arabic language, Fata does not necessarily mean someone who is young in a physical sense. Because in the story of Ashab al-Kahf, Allah uses the same description to describe the companions of the cave, Ashab al-Kahf. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ They were a group of fitya. Fitya is the plural of fata. Imam al-Sadiq, he says, they weren't youth. They were middle-aged men who had so much iman that it's as though their iman gave them so much energy in life that you could consider them to be young. You know, sometimes faith gives you more energy than the energy that you see in some young people. And if you've ever been to Hajj, you've seen this. Especially if you've ever tried to climb Jabal al-Nur. You know, you might be a young guy, you're ready to go, your Nikes are laced up, and you're like, I'm going to go to, the, I'm, you're, I'm going to climb this mountain. And you're sweating and you're struggling, and you think that, you know, this is, you know, look at how fit I am. And then you turn around and you see there's a 90-year-old woman who's right beside you. What is giving that woman the energy to climb that mountain? Iman. The desire to reach the place of the beloved to reach the place where the Prophet used to meditate and worship. So, Fata doesn't necessarily mean young in the physical sense. And this title was also given to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in those battles. La Fata, La Fata illa Ali wa la Sayf illa lil So if this is indeed Yusha ibn Nun, the successor of Musa, it's very interesting that he is given this title of Fata. He's described as a Fata, which is similar to what we see with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in the balance. The story begins with Musa saying to his companion who was with him, probably Yusha, Saying that I will never stop. La abrahu hatta ablugha majma al Bahrain. I will never stop until I reach the junction of the two seas. Now, what's very interesting here is Musa alayhi salam, number one, is so eager to meet this man who will give him that special knowledge. That he tells, so it seems that they've been traveling for such a long time, and probably Yusha is saying that, man, we've been traveling for days, weeks, and months. Let's go back. And hence, Musa turns to him and he says, What? I will never stop until I reach the junction of the two seas. Oh, Amriya Hukuba. The word Hukub in the Arabic language means it's the plural of. So hukba basically means 80 years, which is the average lifespan of a human being. So here Musa is saying that I will never stop until I reach that place. Even if it takes me hukba, even if it takes me many lifespans. Meaning, if I spend the rest of my life just searching for khidr, that will be a life well spent. Look at how important the pursuit of knowledge is. Where Musa alayhi salam, this great messenger of God, he's saying that it's worth it 
to spend your entire life seeking knowledge. Musa is willing to spend his entire life, multiple lifetimes, just to get that special knowledge from Khidr. You and I, no one is asking us to spend every minute of our lives pursuing knowledge. But if Musa is this eager to get some knowledge from Khidr, why, why is it that you and I don't, don't have that same eagerness to take knowledge from Ja'far al-Sadiq, from Musa al-Kadhim? And Imam al-Sadiq in a narration, he says to us that if Musa and Khid were to step into my presence, I would teach them things that neither of them know. This shows you how much we have belittled the intellectual legacy of the Ahlul Bayt, the Ahadith. We have to spend more time deepening our understanding, searching for that knowledge with that same passion that Musa was searching for. What you see here is that Musa is looking for Khidr at the junction of the two seas. That seems like a very vague direction. It's like me, you know, when you want, you know, we live in the, in the time of GPS. I want latitude and long, longitudinal, I want exact location. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give an exact location to Musa as to where you can find Khil. It's pretty vague. It's like me telling you there's a really important person that I want you to meet and you'll meet him on the intersection of these massive highways. Or you can go meet him in this area, but I don't give you specific coordinates. So Musa is not, Allah could have given him specific latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates, but he didn't. Go meet Khilr at the junction of the two seas. The junction of the two seas. Do you know how much shoreline we're talking about? Imagine I say that, go meet this person at Myrtle Beach. Sheikh, where? There's so much shoreline. Why is it intentionally vague here? Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it seems that he made the directions intentionally vague to test Musa to see how eager are you to find this man. Allah makes it difficult because if you want knowledge, the lesson here is what? If you want knowledge, it's not going to be easy. You have to be determined. How much are you willing to search to find spiritual knowledge? Spiritual knowledge is not easy. It requires struggle. This is the same Musa that split the Red Sea. You would think that he would, he would have used his staff to be like, let me teleport. Let me transfer Khidr to my location. Why do I got to go to him? Let's bring Khidr over here. But the lesson is what? That you have to go to him. The, the meeting is made intentionally difficult. And this is one of the problems with you and I today. We want knowledge like that. We don't have the patience to actually read books. I just want to I, I watch a TikTok video. I want to elevate my spirituality in 60 seconds. Some of us, we can't even watch five-minute videos anymore. We can't do it. It's too much, too long. It takes too much of my time. I don't have time. Too much of a sacrifice. Look at Musa. I'm willing to travel many lifetimes to attain the spiritual understanding. And I'm willing to go to him. Even though I'm a prophet of God, I'm one of the greatest messengers of God. I am willing to travel to the ends of the earth to be a humble student of this man. That's humility. They were traveling, and of course, when you travel, you have to take food with you. And there are no refrigerators, so you need to take food that's non-perishable. So it says, when they reached, When they reached, the junction of the two seas, they forgot 
their fish. They brought fish to eat. And it seems that this was probably some type of salted, roasted fish that they were carrying with them. Again, very simple meal. This fish slipped away into the sea. So this is kind of bizarre. Now the story introduces a fish that slips away. Verse number 62. So again, they reach the junction of the seas, but again, where? We've reached the junction of the two seas, but you have all of this shoreline. Is he here? Maybe he's all the way and we got to travel many more miles. So they've arrived. So they know that Khifr has to be here somewhere. Now we got to go find him. Verse number 62. When they continued, Musa then, when they continue, they continue on their journey. Musa turns to his companion and he says, bring our lunch. The lunch was what? The roasted fish that slipped away. <laughs> Musa says that it's been a very long journey. We're exhausted. We're tired. Let's take a break. Let's have some lunch. Verse number 63. The companion shares something with Musa. He says to Musa that, oh Musa, do you remember when we sought refuge with that rock? I forgot the fish. I forgot about something that happened there. I forgot to tell you about what happened to the fish. وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهُ إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ أَذْكُرَ Shaytan made me forget. And we'll speak about what this means. He made me forget. وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ أَذْكُرَ وَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ عَجَبًا The roasted fish leaped into the sea wondrously. Meaning that he's telling him that this fish that was cooked it came to life and it leaped into the sea. Now here, what could possibly make you forget to tell Musa that a roasted fish came back to life and dived into the sea? That seems like a pretty unforgettable thing. How do we understand this? The key word here is, if you look at Ayah 63, Oh, Musa, do you remember when we sought refuge under that rock or with that rock? The word that the companion uses is awayna. Awayna basically means that we sought refuge. So I want you to try to picture this. They're traveling and something happened that probably meant, meant, made them feel endangered and they sought refuge underneath a rock. Now, there must have been some type of storm, some type of hurricane, something must have happened that made them hide under that rock. Because if you take the same word, Seeking refuge. If you go to Surah 11, verse 43, when the flood of Noah came, Noah's son says to his father, because Nuh says to his son, when it starts raining, when that storm comes, Nuh says to his son, get on the ark. Join us on the ark, oh my son. But what does the son say? Qala sa'awi. He uses the same verb. I will seek refuge on the top of the mountain from the flood. So here, what is very possible is that there must have been a very severe storm 
like a life and death situation. Musa and Yusha ibn Nun are in the middle of the storm. The fish is on top of the rock and they're trying to survive. And in the middle of this chaos, the fish basically dived into the sea. So it's not that Yusha or the companion, whoever this companion is, most likely, it's not that he forgot. It's that they, he was overwhelmed by this storm where it was life and death. Because he says, remember when we sought refuge at that rock, I forgot to tell you about the miraculous thing that happened. And the only thing that could make you forget about that is that you, mu you must have escaped a life and death situation. Because the priority was just to stay alive. And then he says, وَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ عَجَبًا Now, so again, when, when the verse says shaitan, when he says shaitan made me forget, this doesn't mean that shaitan erases your memory. What shaitan does, he doesn't erase your memory. He makes certain things appear more important than others so that you prioritize things that don't need to be prioritized. You deprioritize some things and you prioritize others. So in this moment, what does shaitan do? The only thing that shaitan can do to these two men, he can't make them commit a sin. He can simply cause a delay in Musa meeting Khil. That's all he can do. But look at how, look at how persistent shaitan is. If I, can't you if I can't make you commit a sin, I'm not going to leave you. Look at the de determination of shaitan. If I can't make you commit haram, I'll at least make you do something makru. If I can't make you do something that's makru, I'll make you do something that is mubah, that's just permissible. Now, if I can't make you abandon a wajib, I'll make you abandon something that's mustahab. Shaitan is not going to leave you. If I can't prevent the meeting between Musa and Khir, I will at least delay it. See the persistence of Shaitan? Now, verse 64. Musa knows that Musa is looking for a sign. That there is going to be a sign when we are close to Khil. And Khil literally means green. And it seems some scholars have said that he was given this name because one of his miracles is that he gives life to things. So he gives spiritual life through his knowledge, but also one of his miracles is that he has the ability to give life to things. So, the, the, so just being in the presence of Khil gave life to a dead fish. And they say, what's the point of going for the ziyara of Ahlul Bayt? If the presence of Khil gives life to a dead fish, imagine what will happen to us if we're in the presence of the Prophet, of the Ahlul Bayt, We're looking for that spiritual life, that spiritual energy. Ayah 64. Musa says, that is what we were seeking. We were seeking that sign. So they retraced their footsteps. They retraced their footsteps. They went back. I 65. And then they found Allah. Look at how Allah describes Khidr. And they found a servant from among our servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Khidr the ultimate honorary title. So sometimes, so Abd is used in the indefinite because there's no Alif Lam in front of it. So sometimes when words are in the Nakira form, in the indefinite form, either it means they met a great servant. So sometimes the indefinite conveys greatness. 
But sometimes it conveys the opposite, that they saw one servant among our servants. It's as if Allah is saying that I'm so great that Khidr is just one of my soldiers. He's just one of my servants. What is so special about this servant of God? We gave him mercy from us, a special mercy. See, all of us receive the mercy of God. But most of us, we've only exposed ourselves to the material aspects of God's mercy. We get the, the material blessings. But this is a man who received special mercy, spiritual insight. He received wisdom. He received the things that many people are deprived of. Many people. There are, there are a lot of millionaires and billionaires in the world. There are a lot of very wealthy people in the world. But that's not true wealth. The real wealth, the enduring wealth is the spiritual gifts. Wisdom. You can't put a price on wisdom. They found a man who was granted special mercy by God, and he has special knowledge. Not knowledge that is gained through conventional means. Knowledge that comes from a divine source. So Khidr wasn't a student of anybody. No. This is a very special person who has been endowed with special knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ayah 66. قَالَ لَهُ مُوسَى هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ Look at how humble Musa is. He doesn't say, I am Musa, the one who God has spoken to directly. Teach me what you know. Look at the humility. Can I follow you? Can I just tag along? Can I follow you so that you can teach me from what you have been taught of sound knowledge. He doesn't say, oh, Khidr, teach me everything that you know. He says, can I just join you? And can you teach me something of what you know? He doesn't say, I am Musa. Tell me everything that you know. I can handle it. No, look at the humility. Musa understands knowledge. And he understands that. Now, you would think that after this long journey and probably facing a near-death experience, you would imagine, he says, that I came this far, tell me everything that you know. No. It's worth it to go all of this, even if Khidr gives you something of what he knows. It's worth reading all of Al-Kafi, all of Bihar al-Anwar, even if you take just one drop from the ocean of Ahlul Bayt. It's worth it. Because that one drop will satisfy your thirst in this life and in the hereafter. Just one drop from their ocean. Musa says, just give me one drop. And by the way, what we have from Ahlul Bayt is only one drop. Dua Kumail, with its greatness and its depth and its beauty, Dua Kumail is one tiny drop from the ocean of Ali ibn Abi Talib. <laughs> All of the ahadith that we have from Ja'far al-Sadiq. You think Ja'far al-Sadiq gave you everything that he has? It is nothing but a drop from the ocean of Ja'far al-Sadiq. That's okay. Because their drops are our oceans. Their drops are our oceans. Musa says, just give me, give me a little bit of what you have. And that's enough. That would, this journey would be worth it if I just take a little bit. The next verse... Ayah 67, قَالَ إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعْيَ صَبْرًا Khidr, he says to Musa that you're never going to be able to be patient with me. You may think, wait, we just met. How do you know? We just met. How do you know that I don't have patience? Because Khidr knows that me and Musa, we have very different types of knowledge. Musa has knowledge of the Sharia. He has knowledge. He has exoteric knowledge. 
as some of the mystics have said, some of the Urafa have said. He has the exoteric knowledge. He has the knowledge of the scripture. I have a different type of knowledge. I have knowledge of the unseen. Now, it's not that Musa doesn't have knowledge of the unseen. I am operating, I am doing things that are based on hidden knowledge. Whereas Musa is acting on apparent knowledge. And some scholars have said that this is perhaps why the meeting place occurred at the junction of the two seas. The junction means the meeting place between two seas. And some have said that this is symbolic because these are the, this is the coming together of two oceans of knowledge, the hidden knowledge and the apparent knowledge, the esoteric and the exoteric. So Musa is a knowledge, is an ocean of knowledge, but it is, he has the knowledge of the Sharia, whereas Khidr has this very deep, mysterious, hidden knowledge that's connected to the, to the unseen world. They're both oceans of knowledge, but there's just different types of knowledge. And if you don't understand the hidden, you will naturally object because you are, you are operating based on the vahir, the apparent. Whereas I am operating according to a different paradigm. You will never be able to be patient. And the fact that patience here is mentioned. Look at the importance of patience. We think that patience is only when you lose your job. You Got to be patient, right? When you propose and your proposal is declined, you think. And then they put up the, the ayah that, you know, with every hardship comes ease and that's usually when people cite that verse, with every hardship comes ease. Yes, these are all instances where you have to have patience. But how many of us think about the importance of having patience when you're trying to seek knowledge? You gotta be patient. It takes time. You're not, gonna be, you're not gonna become knowledgeable just by reading one book or watching one YouTube video. It takes time. It's a gradual process. And we live in a time where things have to be instant and it's very dangerous. Things need time. So he says, you will never be able to be patient. And then he says in Ayah 68, tasbiru ala ma lam tuhit bihi khubra? The Khidr says, and how can you even be patient regarding something that your knowledge just, just does not encompass? Because this is something that is beyond the realm of what you know. Now, what does Musa say? Look at the persistence of Musa. He doesn't give up. He still wants to learn. But Khilal is basically giving him this warning. Like, Listen, I'm not going to overpromise you. This is what, what it's going to take for you to benefit from. Me. There's this transparency between the teacher and the student. Musa doesn't say, don't worry, I got this. I am Kareem Allah. I'm the great messenger of God. He says, you will find me God willing. Inshallah. God willing, I'll be patient. So we have to also learn this. Don't think that you have the skill set and you don't need anybody. Yes, confidence is important. But only the confidence that is coupled with placing your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This independent confidence is very destructive. No, you can't do it on your own. You need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will not disobey any of your orders. I am humbly your servant. I will not disobey you. Ayah 70. So now, Khidr says to him that, listen, if you follow me and you accompany me on this journey, and we're going to go on an adventure, if you accompany on, on this journey, I have one rule. And that rule is, don't question me about anything that I do until I decide to tell you. Until I decide to tell you. Now, why does Khidr do this? 
it's possible that Khidr wants to teach Musa and teach all of us a very important lesson if you want to be a true student of knowledge. Let the ideas sink in a little bit. You know, sometimes you listen to something you don't understand. Right away, let me ask. Think. Maybe if you think for a few minutes, a few hours, maybe you can figure it out on your own. You got to reflect. You got to think. You have to also put some effort. The teacher is not there to do everything for you. Just be patient. Don't be hasty in asking questions. Ask thoughtful questions. You know, sometimes you might have a scholar and people are asking, Sheikh, what is what surah number is, you know, surah Luqman? It's like, dude, look it up on Google. This is why are you asking questions that you can figure out on your own? That's laziness. So Musa, so Khidr is training Musa that be patient. Just because something doesn't make sense to you right away, it doesn't mean you have to throw your hands up. You're like, I don't know what this means. Tell me, help me. Think, reflect, ponder. And then the journey begins. Ayah 71. I'll just mention this before I conclude. Many of us, we think that only three things happened during their journey. Almost all of us are probably familiar with what happens with the boat, with the boy, and with the erecting of the wall. And we think that that's all that happened. But many scholars have said that Musa and Khidr didn't just spend an afternoon together. They probably spent many weeks and many months together. And the Quran is just mentioning three highlights of that encounter. So inshallah, tomorrow night, we're going to go through that story. We're going to go through that, the, the, uh, the adventure with, with Khidr. And I'll share with you guys some of the most, I believe, some of the most important lessons from that story. Because we don't want this to just be some cool story that's in the Quran. What does it mean for you and I on a practical level? And how does understanding this story affect our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our understanding of the, the phenomenon of human suffering. Inshallah, we'll, we'll discuss that tomorrow night. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tahireen.